Welcome to FACT's webinar called A Novel Solution for Controlling Feast Flies on Pastured Cattle. Our presenter today is Fred Forsberg of Honey Hill Farm. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating today's session. Thank you for joining us. So to begin with just a few very quick introductions, FACT is a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois, and we promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about all of our farmer services. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Fred Forsberg. Fred lives on Honey Hill Farm, a small family farm in Western New York State. Fred is in his 13th year grazing small frame Angus Dockers on managed intensive pastures. He's been awarded four previous research grants through both public and private agricultural research organizations. And he has also contributed to On Pasture Magazine on the topic of managing face flies. So we're incredibly lucky to have him with us today to share his experience and expertise. And Without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Fred so that he may begin his presentation. Fred, please take it away. Hello. Um, as usual, something just happened on my computer and I lost this whole screen. It went blank. Oh, there it is. Whew. <laughs> what you see is, hi folks, uh, what you see is uh, my farm from the back porch. Didn't look like that when we moved here 40 years ago. Uh, I, w I would say it's beautiful. Most people say it's beautiful. What you can see in the background is uh, we're looking we're looking uh, slightly northeast here. Uh, I've got five pastures. They're all beautiful. Uh, it's my belief if you're going to sell food and people are going to come to your house, it better look nice. And uh, we one of the ways we sell is uh, what well, you can't see it to the left there. There's a playhouse. And you're looking at the gazebo by the pond. People come and we sell them beef in the gazebo. Their children play in the playhouse so we can have full attention of mom and dad. Uh, most farms I've been to, there's piles of manure and old junk piled around. Why would anybody buy food in that environment? Anyway, that said, let's see, go on. I think it's important to know who you're who you're listening to. I I had a, a, ver, a rather varied career. I was a grew up in the backwoods of Pennsylvania. I went to Penn State for software development. Very 1966, I graduated. It was a two-year program, very quick, funded by the Department of Defense, and I was a software engineer until 2002. Until and I wanted to get out because we bought this farm in 1978 to farm someday and. Uh, by the time my kids were out of college, I was ready to go. So we started farming in 2000. Well, I started preparing in 2002. In 2003, we were in mixed. We were certified organic. We went into pasture. We had uh, pasture broilers, full spectrum of, of uh, vegetables, five high tunnels, all those things. Uh, because I was in, a, uh, I was used to high t or new technology. We were, I believe, the first high tunnels in Western New York. We commenced grazing of cattle in 2007, but after all that, you know, we started at 55, and I'm now 71. My wife and I said, you know, we don't have any spare time, so we we ditched all the vegetable operations and exited everything except cattle in 2015. And so we're having a wonderful time. I love doing this, and we'll do this as long as I can. Now, some of the things, and I, so why do I do this, and why do I sort of have a different frame of reference now because I've done some research projects and, and they're listed there. I've got two of them highlighted. The first one I had literally in the first year of of agriculture. Now these are competitive, national, and paid projects, and it's been great fun. And I'm I would like to uh, suggest that any anybody who has any ideas consider these things. One of the things is. Uh, I've got all, I got three of these through SARE. It means Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. It's a uh, department of uh, USDA, 
and they're competitive and national. Although SARE's broke up in the four regions, so I'm in the Northeast region. Uh, vinegar is a herbicide. So how did I do that? It was simply I was online. I take winters off. Googling around, I found somebody doing research with vinegar as a herbicide. Well, garlic was our principal crop. I know this is not about beef, and I'm just going to spend a minute about, about research. Uh, garlic was our principal crop, and we raised that large amounts of it, even as gardeners, and, give, and just took it to work and gave it away. And everybody loves local garlic. Uh, and I found that vinegar would kill plants. Now, now I'm organic, so vinegar's acetic acid. And it doesn't build up in the soil, and, when it's, and, when it's, and it's uh, compliant with uh, the uh, with organic certification programs. But nobody had taken it into the field yet, so I was the first one to take it into the field from all the research I've done in in, in 2003. And by gosh, it worked. So then I've had an idea. And so, so I put myself in that mode so that everything I was, you hear people saying, why doesn't somebody do that? Well, if you want to do something, do it yourself. I developed a whole variety of things. I, had, I developed a platform to plant garlic. I did some garlic seed improvements and other things. And so that's who I am. Go to the next slide here. This is simply an overview of my farm. We have 50 acres, 38 acres of perennial pastures. They're all native perennial pastures. I did literally nothing to them except mow them and mow them and mow them until the more you mow, and especially if you mow when, uh, when the weeds, a lot of, especially biannual weeds, if you mow them when they, after they flower, they, you, you've killed them. So without any, without, I don't, I have never used a herbicide in this farm. You can see that grass is beautiful. Absolutely fantastic. We have, we're 100% fenced. I got four wire high tensile throughout the farm, pipe water. On, uh, I, I don't know how many grazers are out there, but I have probably 2,000 feet of three quarter inch water pipe. It's plastic pipe, very inexpensive, incredibly easy to install. We do something called management intensive grazing. If you notice right in front of the cattle, you see a uh, a single line running across there. That's that's the temporary wire. I move them. Well, I only have 16 cattle a year. We're a very small operation. We sell directly to consumers. I'll get into that later. Um, if you notice behind the cattle, you can see it's grazed. I move them 20 or 30 feet, literally, ahead at every movement. I'll move them three times in the height of the grading per day using that temporary wire. Now that field's 450 feet wide. I've got six step-in posts. It literally takes a couple of minutes. So it's very simple. The cattle learn to do that in about two days. They very seldom ever get past that wire. Maybe one, one cow a year will get past that wire. But I always have the next wire set up such that they can't get past me when I'm moving it. We have, uh, let's see what else do we have? Uh, we have a holding area with a bud box. I wanted to mention that for, for a moment for anybody that raises cattle and does it for a, for a handling situation. It was always extremely stressful here to load cattle. And I got hurt last year. I got run over by by a thousand pounder. And uh, I said, that's it. We're going to build a bud box. I'm not going to get into that, a bud box, but you can look it up. If you don't have one and you have a stressful situation, highly recommend. Cost you maybe a thousand dollars to put one in. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Clarissa, I'm on uh, one, two, on slide number five. Uh, did, you, did you move that already to catch up to me? Well, right now I have the overview. Would you like to go forward one? Uh, the overview, which one is the overview? The one with the picture of the cows. Oh, yes. Go to the next one, please. Yes. Okay. Sure. So we started in uh, 2007. Like I said, we only run a small herd. I buy him from a single source. Turns out that he's the son-in-law of my Cornell Cooperative Extension grazing specialist. So he is 100% grass-fed and never, never medicated. We buy cattle at... Uh, 
they're they're uh, yearlings, about 13 months old. We we uh, we graze them for 200 days. They average about two two pounds per day. That's that's been the consistent now for years. And so we're bringing in cows at 700, sending them out at 1050, 1100 pounds. We go to the best processor in in central and western New York. And if you're selling beef the way we do it, you want the best quality. These people, it's precision cutting, uh, dry age for two weeks. I don't know anybody else that does that. Uh, most people claim aging, but it's wet aging, and it's not really aging at all. Uh, uh, it's the best packaging I've ever seen. Like I said, I sell to high-end customers mostly, but not everybody. But we sell to people who are really concerned with the quality of their meat. And, uh, and, and that's what we do in, in our processor. Uh, really a partner. We take winters off. We're generally, we uh, bring cattle in uh, the last week of April, and they're all gone by December. Next slide, please. Could say, know your enemy. That is a female fleece fly. I've looked at my cattle and I thought, wow, what, what the heck's going on here? They're constantly stamping their feet, shaking their head. And what really concerned me is one year a friend asked me to uh, take care of a couple of horses for a few weeks. So we had the horses out there. And they were, I mean, I mean, talk about radical uh, shaking and, and carrying on to try to get those flies. That's what really convinced me to start doing this. Anyway, face flies are rather interestingly pasture flies, not feedlot flies. And the simple reason is that the the female will only lay her eggs in undisturbed, undisturbed manure pats. And there's also a lot of evidence to show that they she actually prefers grass-fed cattle. So you're not going to see them in feedlots. Uh, the face, so it's only the female that does this, like like mosquitoes. It's only the female that 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 uh, that bites, or, or in, in this case, they don't bite. They have uh, rasping mouth parts that uh, that that annoy the that that annoy the uh, those sensitive members, and so the eye start to weep, and the nose and the muzzle. And the mouth starts to weep, and that's what they feed on. They're feeding on a protein source to lay their eggs. And you can imagine feeding around the eyes causes tissue damage, and and uh, one of the serious uh, uh, pathogens is pink eye, and it's highly contagious. Now, that's not an issue here on this farm because my cattle won't; they'll all be gone, processed by the end of the year. But my my uh, my supplier certainly has that problem, potential problem of having pink eye because he has cattle there all the time. Face flies are present uh, throughout the summer, but, but they're really, really, uh, the population explodes in July and August. Painting control, as you might imagine, is, uh, uh, is pretty difficult because where they fly, where they, where they feed, it's very sensitive organs. So a uh, recommended... Uh, the only recommended conventional method is a forced contact with insecticide. Now, I've never seen this before. It's some kind of bag that's filled with a pherethrum, I believe, but it's something that we can't use in an organic concept. So I had to find another solution. Go to the next slide, please. So what's the problem statement? Face flies are one of two most significant flies doing the greatest harm. The other one, of course, is a horn fly. I don't ha seem to have a heck of a lot of horn flies, and, and I was more concerned with the face flies. I, I may look into that, however, but at this point, I've only I've only done any research on on face flies. What the problem is? C cattle spend so much time. I, if anybody who has cattle will realize they'll see, they're they're generally generally in the shade if they can find it, and they're standing there shaking and constantly flicking their tails, but mostly their heads. And what that causes is less grazing. And so you're going to have reduced grazing and, and reduced ruminating. Now, all these, all the data I'm providing you is, is official USDA data. The interesting thing is 
is that there's actually very, very little known about face flies. When I started this in 2000, I think it was 2015, I couldn't find anything. I, I'm pretty adept at, at, at internet searches. I, I looked and there's, it, it turned out to be literally all the same thing with different words. And I found out that there was in the 1950s, there was a, a postdoc at Cornell who wrote the definitive paper, and it's been lost. For four years I've been trying to find that. Still can't find it. What they found, USDA research, I, I'm talking about how, how, do, how do face flies find, find their host? They don't know. I mean, for example, uh, with mosquitoes, mosquitoes are attracted by, to mammals by carbon dioxide. There is no real evidence how face flies actually find the cow, although there's there's some some thought because the face fly will 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 find a manure pat within literally seconds to a minute. As soon as that cow drops that, they're on it to put to to uh, to deposit their eggs where, where the larvae grow in that manure pat. They found, the USDA found that uh, 12, 12 flies per animal had a substantial, you can see 12 to 15% reduction in weight gain. That's serious, and we're going to get into that soon. The fly uh, has a reproduction rate, it's pretty fast, two to three weeks. In, in the hot weather, it's only two weeks, so, so the population can, can explode almost literally in, in, in that time frame because there's constantly on a daily basis, new flies coming out. Another, obviously, again, re state restating, pink eye is a significant issue. Next, next slide, please. So we should be on slide eight. Now, this is controversial. Uh, I had, I mean, doing the math, I only raised 16 cattle. The average gain is 400 pounds per day or I'm sorry, 400 pounds over 200 days. Um, so I calculated the loss. Now, you're seeing a different slide than I had. I, I went back, I talked to some people, and they said my, my, my data was, was, was too large. I calculated originally a loss of $198 per animal. I had Larissa change it back to a lower value. But after looking at it, I believe I'm right, but the problem is it's very difficult to make these kind of statements without very legitimate research in highly controlled conditions. How can I I don't have any any capability to do that. And and statistics based on very small samples is 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 uh not taken very seriously. What you're seeing is $75. I believe it's substantially more, but I wanted to be conservative. So uh, to me, that would be over $3,000 worth. Uh, we, sell, we sell our beef only in eighths or halves. With an eighth, it's literally one eighth a cow. We, we have it cut in a specific way such that we can bring it home after it's all frozen and it's cold, it's cold out, it's below freezing. We set it out in a clean barn in different piles and divide it by eight, literally. A great deal of those people who buy eights go into halves or holes, but a hole is simply two halves. With a half, you can have it cut any way you want it. I suspect anybody that does beef is exactly the same. So... How did I, I, I kept trying to think, how, how can I capture these flies? I walk in through the field, I see, I see occasionally flies on the fence post. I was unaware at that point that they were probably all males all sitting on the fence post, because the females are all sitting on the cows. Um, one day, I was taking, I was building, you know, we built pastures, we have multiple, we have five pastures. Um, we brought them on as we could afford it, I mean, as the, the vegetable operation was, was supporting the cattle operation at that point. And we, were built, we built pastures and, and fence. Now we have 12,000 feet of high tensile, four-wire four high tensile, but we put them in one pasture at a time. And I had to, and I had to you know, we, we lived here for 
several decades before we started this. And my fence rows, they went from 20 or 30 feet wide to 100 feet wide because, well, you, know, you can imagine how. I mean, even though I was mowing every year around them, the, f the trees would move out. And, and in order to get hit in the face with a tree, you'd, pretty soon they were 100 feet wide. So we spent a lot of time taking these fence rows out anyway and a lot of money. One day I found a piece of steel. It was a piece of sheet steel. I think it was off of an old combine. I'm carrying it back, and I see... Um, I see the drinker was empty. Now we, we have uh, water tanks or 100-gallon Rubbermaid tanks. At the time, I didn't have uh, automated uh, automated valves to refill them. So I, I put that piece of sheet steel, it was probably two feet wide by four feet long, something like that, against the fence post so I wouldn't forget it, and filled or turned the valve on. Cows came down, stuck their heads. The flies flew up and flew right onto that sheet steel. I said, that was the eureka moment. You know, I couldn't believe it, how simple that, that was. It, nobody else thought of that before. Eureka, by the way, that's uh, the old Greek Archimedes. You can look them up if you're not familiar with that. The aha moment. It was absolutely phenomenal. I, I didn't walk. I ran to my shop. I found, uh, I found a board. I don't know, it was three or four feet long, 12 to 16 inches wide. I had I found uh, some of those fly fly ribbons. You know, they're about come a little round packet, about two inches high and half an inch, three quarter inch inch wide. I put a bunch of them on a on that board, took it up there, put it between. Now it was wood, so it was uh, uh, non conductive. I put it up against the wire between the tank and the wire. I didn't know if the cows were going to get into it and. They stuck their nose onto it, and then they go running through the field trying to get that off. Pretty soon they have their whole head wrapped in it. I had no idea. turns out the cows don't ever get into it. I caught hundreds of flies in a couple of minutes. I says, wow, is that cool. So then I went out looking for big fly paper. I Googled big fly paper. Never could find it. Well, if I would have Googled wide fly paper, I would have found it. Uh, I happened to be at Tractor Supply a couple of weeks later, and there it was sitting right on the shelf. The next slide, please. There it is. 2,000 flies in an afternoon. Just a piece of plywood stuck on with duct tape. Absolutely, absolutely surprised how easy that was. I did... I. I I continued that throughout the summer, and I saw the fly population decrease substantially. Now, I I can't prove that anymore because it was all on my cell phone, and unfortunately, my cell phone is somewhere in Canada. On August the 31st last year, we took a three-week vacation. That's why my fly population fly exploded on my cattle because I wasn't I wasn't trapping them. I eventually. Um, I, I couldn't find any any paper, and I spent I literally spent a year and a half trying calling different companies. Nobody ever called me back. It turns out that I, I eventually found on the internet the the people who actually make the product. All the people on the internet were suppliers of the product. They entered. I, I asked for the VP in R R and D, and by gosh, he answered. And he was so interested in the in the in what I was doing. He drove here from Brooklyn, New York. It's a six-hour drive. And the next slide, please. That's what we have now. Now, rather than the uh, that, that previous product is was made by the same company. It's uh, 12 inches wide and it's 30 feet long. But it was always a pain in the neck for me to you, know, you get stuck to it, and I couldn't staple it like I wanted to on the board. You had to put it with duct tape because, of course, the stapler would get stuck to the to the to the fly paper and it was kind of floppy and it was very thin it was very effective but I, I needed something that was uh more more efficient and so i have this now what what we have here is something called a glue board it's used by the in the commercial in commercial food establishments in factories uh, where they have permanent uh, containers where they have these glue boards and they can pull them out. And, 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 and the thing that I liked about it is, first, it's a heavier material for, and can be used in exterior, 
and, and I, I've had them out there for days at a time, and they're still and they're still sticky. I could staple it to the board because the 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 exterior edges uh, don't have any glue on them. And the most important part, they they come with a with a thin sheet across the top of them that I don't that I that would, to deploy it you then pull off. So when I'm carrying it, and sometimes I'm carrying it to the other end of the of the uh, of the farm, and it's a half a mile. You know, I don't you can get it stuck to ha half a dozen things in the way. So that's what I prefer this. Now the downside with using the glue board is they're four dollars a piece. The uh, thirty foot long. Uh, previous product with the same material is only seven dollars. I can't. The, the company only deals. The manufacturer only deals with professional fly control companies, and that's the reason the difference in price. Until until somebody decides to start providing that to the public, you're going to have a hard time finding finding those uh, the glue boards. But like I said, the other product is. Uh, is as convenient or is as successful but less convenient. Go to the next slide, please. I was preparing after all this time. I spent so much time trying to find other solutions and one of the things I wanted to do was was determine what attracts these flies. I could never find that out. I tried all kinds of things. I've noticed when I walked through the field, I was being attracted by flies around my head. So I actually put some of this paper, this glue paper, on top of my hat, and I caught a variety of other flies. They weren't face flies. I, I had uh, purchased some helium balloons, and I stuck the fly paper to the helium balloons and put that on some of the fence posts. Never caught a face fly. So it wasn't movement. Uh, like I said, nobody knows what what attracts the face fly. So I've been I've been simply happy to simply to catch them in that method. I have those hundred gallon tanks. I move the tanks every two days or three days along the fence row. The cows usually drink it down, and then I move it as I move the fence because I move the fence forward two or three times, three days in the spring, two days in the summer, constantly moving through. It's very simple to move them. Let's see. So anyway, I was prepared. To, I'm a member of something called OnPasture.com. It's an internet uh, group. It has all, and I highly anybody any grazers out there, I highly suggest you become. Doesn't cost anything, but uh, they ask you for a donation. We we donate to them annually. But I was scooped. I was a little. I was a little frustrated. So you see a. Uh, a barrel wrapped with flypaper. I was just ready to put my documentation onto onpasture.com, and this guy scooped me a week before. So I was, I was laughed about it. Now, uh, in my situation, I couldn't use. I think the barrel is a cool idea. If you have a stationary, so you can, you can see he has a. There's a wire between to keep the cattle away from that drum, and the tank. Um, that I don't have that situation, and I'd have to carry a barrel along, so it's very inconvenient in my situation because our tank moves all the time. So, so if you have a situation like that, I suggest you use that. Otherwise, um, my solution is quite successful. Uh, and you can see the, a close-up of the of the flypaper that's available at Tractor Supply, Walmart, Lowe's, and a whole lot of other uh, other outlets. Now. This information went out on some somebody found out and and uh, let's see I, I don't remember how they found out but I was in a I've been in a magazine I was in an, an uh, forget now it's a it's a mag it's a magazine that uh, that shows all kinds of farmer innovation so I was published in there that was good fun people all over the United States called me uh, uh, I had vets calling me and. Uh, I provided exactly the same information I'm providing you, and and I'm ready to go to my next task. I'm willing to speak to anybody that wants to take this to the next step, or simply ask a question. My my website is honeyhillorganicfarm.com. Again, honeyhillorganicfarm.com. You can contact me through my website. 
and then we can communicate if anybody wants to ask any question, wants to do this themselves, I want to pass this off to somebody else, I have other fish to fry. So uh, that is the end of my presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Fred. That was wonderful. Um, we do have um, a bit of time now to take questions from folks. If you have something you want to ask advice on or pick Fred's brain, um, please type your questions into that chat box onto the, on the left-hand side of your screen, and I'm going to kind of monitor them, read them out loud, and then um, have Fred answer them. So we've had a couple come in so far. Um, uh, one audience member, Fred, wants to know if you can talk a little bit about the cost per pound of uh, the processor that you use, um, since it's such a high quality one. What 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 does that mean in terms of cost per pound? Well, I, I'm I'm I don't understand cost per pound of what? Well, the question is cost per pound for processing. I can't, I couldn't Maybe tell you that off the top of my head. But one thing I did yeah. I did I did forget to say is what I charge. Uh, people might be interested in that. Most people are scared yeah. to say those kind of things. I sell our we sell our beef only, like I stated, one eighth or one one half. I think we invented the eighth. There might be other people doing the eighth, but but 15 years ago, uh, I never heard of one. But we were also in the pasture raised chicken business, and we realized that most people didn't have a deep freeze. I thought everybody had a deep freeze. I'm a country boy. We always had a deep freeze. So I had to create a product that people could put into a standard freezer compartment of a refrigerator. That is probably two cubic feet. This is 1.5 cubic feet, so it'll fit. And I actually had a customer who allowed me to come in her house and, and fill a refrigerator because she was a teacher. Of course, her mom was there uh, taking care of the kids. And the only thing that didn't fit was the ice cream. So grandma <laughs> brought a bunch of spoons out and said, kids, come and eat this ice cream. <laughs> so I know it fits in there. Uh, we, uh, we sell only uh, retail, only in those quantities, and we charge eight and a quarter a pound per, per pound based on net weight, not mm -hmm. hanging weight, retail cuts like you'd find in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that's that's that is a great information to have. Um, someone also wants you to speak uh, or explain the, your aha moment. And can you explain or describe what exactly you know kind of the flies were attracted to in that initial um, incident? What was it again that you you found? It was a, sh a sheet. Oh, oh, I. It, it, it yeah. was just a piece of sheet steel. It was I, I don't know a foot wide by three or four feet long. I mean, this is so long ago. It was a piece of... St <laughs> this, this predated us. I mean, when we moved here, there was all kinds of junk in the fence rows. I mean, so many farms, they just they use them as dumps. And, you know, we, we cost, it took us so much time and so much money to clean these fence rows out. And I found a piece of steel laying there. So when I put it... So I was walking towards the barn or toward the shop to, to get rid of it. I noticed the, the drinker was empty. So I put it up against the fence post on the other side of the fence from the cattle and I turned the drinker on and they came in and they flew off so when the cattle dipped their head into the tank the flies all flew off and they landed on the first flat spot mm -hmm. I, I, it was absolutely an astounding moment I mean I, and so I mean, does everybody know who Archimedes is? Maybe he was—he's the one, a founder of buoyancy principle and how to, how to. Uh, how, he was taking a bath, literally. He's a, a legitimate uh, uh, mathematician in like the sixth century in Greece, and he uh, he developed the buoyancy principle, how to how to determine weight based on use of water. Mm -hmm. So the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, was it the same thing? I didn't run through. I didn't run through town. With it. I didn't run through town naked out of the bathtub. I ran to the shop, fully clothed with a, <laughs> with these flies. I, I was the absolutely blue. surprised by it. But, but that was he. He said the eureka moment. That's uh, Greek for aha. I found it. 
Excellent. Okay. So the next question someone has to um, just to clarify: Are you changing the glue tape every time that you move the water? No, not necessarily. I only change it. That's a good question. I'm glad uh, glad that came up. I only change it when it's full. When 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 there's there's so much there's so many flies on it that that uh, that I don't know if I'm catching all of them. But here's one thing I want to interject. Also, I said only the female. Uh, uh, is 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 damaging cattle. The, ma the male's only only job is to mate with the females. Uh, mm. I figured that would be all females on that on on the paper. And I, I actually I found again I, it was a lot of work, and I found a a professor I think it was the University of Minnesota, a retired entomologist that was interested in this. Also, he saw my article in in uh, in, in this one magazine. And uh, where I was interviewed, and uh, we had a conversation, and he said he would he volunteered to to take a look at what flies I was attack, attack, attracting. And I was quite surprised to find out that it was actually fifty fifty males and females. Apparently, the males followed the flea females right to the to the glue to the glue board, <laughs> but it was something like ninety nine percent face flies we were catching. That's astounding. Mm -hmm. Now there was another thing I forgot. I mean, I wanted to in 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 the, in the concept of how does it attract? How do we attract these flies? Well, I found out my manufacturer, the fly material, had black fly paper. Black is black Angus. We didn't catch mm -hmm. a single face fly, and I had it out there for a week. That to me is absolutely astounding. In the same environment, not a single face fly landed on that paper. I don't know what 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 is on that paper that's attracting those face flies. Did that uh, did that answer the question? Yeah, no, that's that's great. Mm -hmm. I love, yeah, those those little details, those little bits are really helpful. Um, someone wants to know how many different places do you put the fly paper? Is it all on? You know, you keep it to one board, or do you kind of break it up a little bit? No, no I only put it on one board behind the. Uh, Behind the tank, for the simple reason is that's where the flies are. They are on the. They're always on the cattle until they drink. And see, that was the whole problem. I thought about this for a couple of years. I noticed, you know, I'm walking through the pastures when I'm changing, when when I when I was turning on the valves or when I was working, I would see the flies around the tank, but not that many of them. Of course, so they're probably on the other side of the the pasture or on 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 the uh, on the post. But but putting that flat board on there allowed more flies to go to one spot, and it, I, I was it was just a shocking moment. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> my answer to the question. Uh, oh, yeah, the different places. <laughs> no, I only put I only put it there because the flies the flies are only there. They're either on the cattle or when the cattle are drinking, they go someplace else. Right. And that's and that's on that board. And kind of related, someone wants to know if you have a sense of how close the fly paper needs to be to um, the board to the to the water. How you know? Did you did well, you, you can kind see, of see, test did, out? Simple, yeah. Well, put up. Uh, let's see. What what number would that be? Number ten, please. Put that number mm -hmm. ten up. It's literally behind the tank, and you can see the wire. It's resting against the wire behind the tank. My thinking was, I didn't want to take the risk of the cows putting their nose on that and getting stuck. I mean, my cattle are essentially wild. I can't touch them. I can't get within five or six feet of them. If one was to get that on its on its nose and then start rubbing it on the ground, get cover its eyes, I, I, there's no way I could uh, remove it. So I wanted, to, I, I wanted to be careful, and they never touch it. it it's simply, and it's against the wire, and they so they stay away from it, but they're very cl they're mm -hmm. close enough to us as they as they dip their head they're maybe a you know a foot and a half away. Mm -hmm. I don't think there'd be any use to put paper up any place else because, like I said, when I when I put those balloons out, I didn't capture a single face fly. The cattle might have been only a hundred feet away. Fascinating. Um, someone wants to know if you're able to if you what the total cost, approximate cost, I would say, for this method per year for your farm. 
guess it would be well, that would, the that would be, cost it's of highly the, variable. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I put it out, uh, I'm probably using two feet. Two feet. No, I'm, I wouldn't. I'm not going to give a, a value on the glue boards because they're almost impossible to find, and they're and they're too expensive. Uh, if I didn't get them for free, I would. I would be buying. Yeah, the manufacturer's giving me all all the materials I want for free. Um, mm. If I was doing this, I would. I would buy the the uh, the roll product, which is exactly the same thing. But the the only product, the only problem with it, it's not a problem actually. It's just less convenient for me. I did, I use I right. use about two feet of the roll product, two two or three feet of the roll product, probably three feet. So that's ten uses. So that's seventy seventy cents for a few days. So. so Mm-hmm. On a per day basis, if I say if it's three days worth, or whatever, you know, twenty five cents a day, that's just mm-hmm. inconsequential uh, mm-hmm. because it's thirty feet long. I hope that answers it. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah, I guess it would depend on the the um, price of the product. Um, well, and, and, well, and I should I, excuse me. I should I should I should state that I don't change it every day. I only change it out. Yeah. When it's full, you know, when you initially start and you have a lot of flies, you're probably going to fill it up every couple, every day. But as you reduce the fly pop- population, and don't forget, when you attack, you are destroying that, that fly and all her progeny forever. <laughs> and so you can reduce that fly, fly population real quick. But you have to keep it up. If you keep it up, if you don't keep it up, obviously it rebounds mm-hmm. very quickly, also because they're in, in the hot, in the warmest season. It's only a two week from from laying the egg to an adult. Yeah. So, have you seen someone wants to know? You know, when you're kind of um, in the thick of things and really um, changing it out as needed, have you seen um, less than five to ten? flies per animal have you seen that kind of reduction or what what i you have know? seen that yes i have seen yeah. substantial reduction but the problem is you know and this and this is where, where it gets in with you know my my comments on uh, on my total loss it it's so variable i mean if you're going to do proper science you have to have a completely controlled environment well I I don't have that on the farm, so I'm I'm not as much concerned with with baseline statistics as I am trying to reduce the number of flies on my cattle. If I keep this up, I've noticed that that I have reduced the population substantially to its so it's not to the point that there are always going to be flies. I'm never going to be able to be 100 percent. But I reduced it to the point where the cattle did not seem to be. They were not hiding out and shaking their heads. I have read articles where cows went, cr- I mean, nuts. I mean, run into a pond or into a stream uh, uh, because of the harassment is so is so profound uh, on them. I, m- I imagine there might be other other species that might or other breeds that might be more. Susceptible to this, the, the, the black my my angus don't seem to get too excited, but they are off feed. There's no doubt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, someone wants to know if you've tried fly traps that use soapy water. Do they catch these flies? I I I don't know how one could do that. Uh, uh, I mean, like I said, the flies are on the cows. If they're not on the cows, they're on some, they're on something when they duck their head. I mean, how how would I put a soapy water out there? I don't even know why they would land on it. In fact, I don't know why they didn't land on that black sheet versus the yellow yeah. sheet. It was in exactly the same position, and I caught not a. It was so strange. Not one. Yeah. So. Well, that. Someone from actually 2000 that to, to, <laughs> to nuts. Well, someone was asking if, if you've tried, and this would probably be similar to the, the black tape, that um, if you've tried kind of using duct tape but the sticky side out, but I imagine that might have the same, um, be the same issue. And duct tape's pretty expensive. I don't know. I don't know. What, 
Yeah, that's actually, that's actually interesting. I may try that out myself. <laughs> but you know, that's there you expensive go. also, and it would be a pain in the neck right. to do that. Probably, and I'm trying. You know, I'm trying. I got so many things to do that that that, that I have to pick what I'm going to do. You know, and uh, I'm and, sure. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not painting the house this year, but I'm doing something else. So I I need I need something that's convenient and quick. Um. So someone also asked if you have tried using the fly paper method near the the cow shade shade areas. Well, see that 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 makes the assumption uh, that one has shade areas, and right. If 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 you're a managed grazer moving your cattle two or three day two or three times a day forward, that would be. It simply wouldn't work out. I mean, I I don't have shade in every, in, in all areas. However, in, yeah. in in many places they were shady areas, but I didn't. I however, and now, now it's just I, I never even thought of some of these things. There are many places yeah. between trees, long long distance between trees. I never saw a different a difference. Beside, by the way, whether I was in a completely shady area or in a totally sunny area, I always. I always there's there's a couple of fields that that have very few trees. I saw no difference in the in the collection of flies. I mean it was it was just like thousands of flies or very few one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I just want to make a, a note to folks that were asking. These slides will be available um, with the pictures so that you can kind of take a deeper dive um, when I send out the follow up email. So just so you know, though, you'll see them again. Um, so someone else asks, so horses wear screen masks. Would this work for for cattle, in your opinion? You actually thought of that. You could probably do that, but you might be able to do that with dairy cows. But, but yeah. how do you do this with, you know, my cattle aren't wild. They've just never been handled. I mean, if you have cattle like cows are handled, dairy cows are handled all the time, that's a different thing. My cattle are on pasture a hundred percent of their life. They do not ever go into a barn, ever. Even in northern climates, you don't have to have cattle in the barn. In fact, people say it's better outside. Mm -hmm. I, I have no facility to put them in, and they don't. And mm -hmm. now, my supplier does have a barn where where where, where the, the the cows cows when I'm seeing now the females go and, and have their have their young but that's, mm -hmm. they're out on pasture within days. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm um. Do you know anything about? Um, someone's asking if chickens would eat the the fly larva. Oh, I'm glad I'm glad you say that. I forgot about that. Now. I, I, I'm going to make an assumption everybody out there has heard of Joel Salatin. If they have mm -hmm. not, uh, S-A-L-A-T-I-N. He is uh, – uh, I've met Joel a couple of times. I've been on a co couple of conference stages with him. Uh, it was great fun. He is an incredible innovator. What he does – now, my when I raised, pa when I raised pasture birds, they were broilers, not hens. A lot of people do not understand the difference. They're different. They are as different as night and day. Uh, broiler, broiler hens are not aggressive, and you know they're slaughtered long before they're adults. When they, when people see hens, they are adult birds and very aggressive. What he does, he he, use, he pastures his birds also, his hens. He has a an egg mobile, I think he calls it. It's a it's a uh, a hay wagon with a little house on it, and that you know the birds go in there at nighttime, so they're not the predator. When predators come out, they're protected. But what he does, he opens he opens the door in the morning, and those hens. We talk, he's talking about like two hundred of them. He is several days behind the cattle. What that does, and they come in and they tear those manure pats apart, digging for grubs. And he's got it timed perfectly, and those just like a day or two before those grubs become adults and fly away, and they eat all those grubs. Wow, is that a cool solution? 
I don't have that facility, and I'm not. And I, and I would if I if I had that. Uh, I, I don't raise anything other than cattle now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I hope that um, answers the question. So, oh, yeah, yeah, great. Um, so I think we have so. The last question I have right now before we kind of wrap up is if you'd like to take a minute or two to talk a little bit more about the, the bud box with the shoots. I know that you um, oh, sure. yeah. spoke about that and then a question just kind of was looking for a little bit more information about it. So, yeah, whatever you'd like to well, share. For, well, first, I can, I can verbalize it, but the best thing to do is, is, is Google bud box. And you're going to find one where you see a guy – a guy very, and this is a big commercial operation, very casually walking in with these great big behemoth cattle, even bigger than mine. I mean, literally a couple feet away and walks right through and loads them right through a chute. I have never had that. <laughs> and it was dangerous. I mean, cattle are not, they're not mean. They're not nasty. I mean, a bull could be, but these are steers and, and, and heifers. They're not going to attack me. In fact, they want to stay away from me. But I had a loading area of 16 feet wide by 60 feet long originally. And this is before I knew about some of the cattle kind of psychology. And it was always dangerous to load the cattle, to try to get them to go into that trailer. And uh, the big trailer they would go into, I found out later, we had a hard, we had a hard time in the, in the fall loading our cattle because it was so muddy, the, tr- the trucker got stuck down there. And so we were like almost three months late getting a cattle out of here. Normally they're gone by November. It wasn't until late February the last ones went. And uh, and so I had to build this structure. And it was so nice. And so what you do, a bud box is generally 12 feet by 12 feet, and you can put four cattle in there, and you go in with them. It's kind of hard to explain this. Now imagine I had this holding pen, 16 by 60, and I put a, a another gate 16 feet in towards the cattle mm-hmm. that is opened, always opened. And then I then and there's a gate at the at the end of the bud box or at, at the end of the bud box. So when I go around, I, I go back into where the cattle are, and they all spook down to the other side. I mean, they just you don't have to spook. You just walk up there, and they'll run right down there because they can see through that gate. Okay, it's called going to light. They're going to light. Then they'll hit that gate, and they'll, and they'll stop. I'm already cl- I've already closed that secondary gate, and it's a shrouded gate. In other words, they can't – it's literally got only a piece of tarp on it. Cows don't know. That's not a rock wall. <laughs> so I just close that gate, and what they do to try to get away from me They'll turn around and they'll see, and they'll go over to that gate where they come from. That's the natural the natural proclivity of the cow is to go back to where it came from. They'll find that gate closed, but right there, to, right immediately to the right, looking at that gate, straight on, is that chute gone out there? They'll find that opening and they'll shoot right up through there. S H O O T versus C H U T E. Okay, they'll. F- Mm-hmm. Fly right up! I couldn't believe it. How how it was absolutely fantastic. All this stress on me. I got knocked down. I got kicked. I got stepped on last year. None of that ever again. No, mm-hmm. and 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 you know it's important for me and for the cows. There's no stress. They go shooting mm-hmm. right down, mm-hmm. right up into the trailer. I could not believe it. My wife was out there with her with her tablet, and, and well, she was doing it from the house. And she said, like, "Where are the cows?" And I said, "See those little black spots running through there?" <laughs> because the shoot is the shoot's made of wood. You know, you can buy them made of steel, but I made mine of uh, of wood using a six by sixes. I I put it's it's twenty twenty four feet long. I used. 14 six by sixes we put five feet in the ground and then i build up with two by six planks on the inside up five feet high so they couldn't jump out Mm -hmm. cows Mm -hmm. actually can jump higher than you can imagine but five feet is enough for my smaller animals Mm -hmm. so that's what a bud box is but look online you can find numerous numerous examples I, I, anybody that r- runs cattle, I highly recommend this. I wish somebody would have told me that. It's a relatively <laughs> new thing. 
Excellent. Well, yeah, thanks for sharing the, those uh, words of wisdom. Um, so I have a few housekeeping items to share with everyone that's still out in the audience before we sign off. Like I mentioned, immediately following the webinar, just a, a minute or two, um, you're going to be asked to complete a very brief survey. And we would greatly appreciate it if you take a minute to tell us about your experience and, you know, give us some um, some feedback for for future webinars and what we can do better and what you'd like to see. Uh, we, we take that into consideration. Also, a recording of the webinar and the slides will be available soon, and they're going to be archived on our website as well. And I will email them all to you um, um, hopefully later today. So I'd like to also call your attention to some other webinars that we have coming up this spring. Uh, in April, we're going to be hosting Megan Filbert from the Practical Farmers of Iowa. She's going to talk about grazing cover crops. And then in May, Annie Wormsey is going to be back to talk with us about how to run a successful intern program on your farm. We're also hoping to fit in a webinar about solar grazing with sheep as well. Um, so, Fred, do you have any parting thoughts before I close the webinar? Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. It's kind of hard to to know what I forgot, <laughs> but I'm glad the questions were excellent. I'm, I'm, glad, they, I'm glad some of that, they, they, were, they were great. I'm, uh, and even gave you some more ideas, frankly. <laughs> I do know that. Well, and I will be, I will be um, CCing Fred as well, if that's okay with you, on the follow-up email, so folks will have your, your um, at least your, um, your farm website, which I know you shared too. So, um, okay. I'm afraid that that is all the time we have today. A very sincere thank you to you, Fred, for your fantastic presentation, and thanks to all of you in the audience for your attention and interest. And I really hope that um, you'll join us on a future webinar. So have a wonderful, sunny, I hope, afternoon, and stay warm. Goodbye.